Okay, so good morning. My name is Megan Ernst. I'm the office manager here at the Small Business Development Center in Staten Island. Our office is one of 24 centers across the state and part of the larger America's SBDC network. We have full-time advisors here on staff to help you with all of your needs to start or grow your business. If you'd like to learn more about our services and set up an appointment or join our email list for future updates, my contact information will be available at the end. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for you to replay afterwards. Look out for an email from me later today with a link to access it. Once this webinar ends, a brief survey will pop up in your browser. If you could please take about 30 seconds to fill it out, I'd greatly appreciate it. It helps us provide more resources for you going forward. Um, there's also a box where you can fill in a suggestion of topics for future webinars, if there's something in particular that you'd like to see. These webinars are brought to you in partnership with Google My Business Program. And um, we, I think we're good to go. Let's get started. So today's workshop is Make Your Website Work For You. Today I'll talk about strategies to build or improve a website that can help you grow online and offline. If you're launching a new business website or sprucing up an old site, today you'll learn how to create a search-friendly site that's useful for customers and supports your business goals through six simple strategies. So whether you've had a website for 10 years or you're just getting started, this workshop will give you the information you need to plan and create or recreate your site to accomplish your business goals. The session looks at six characteristics of a great website. First is goal oriented What are your goals? What is the point of visiting your website? What is the end goal for the user um, to contact you, to make an appointment, to make a sale? You want to figure out what your goals are. The second would be functional, making sure links and buttons and phone numbers are all clickable, things like that. The third would be intuitive to use on any device. The fourth is organized, making sure your site is easy to search, easy to navigate. Being useful, making sure it provides useful information. And last but not least, search friendly, making sure it's findable by all search engines. So let's get started. Many business owners know that building a website is an important early step, but a website can be a lot more useful than a business card or a brochure. With some advanced planning, you can create a site positioned to help your business grow right out of the gate. So let's start by talking about goals. Before building a website, every business owner should consider, consider how it can be used to achieve business goals. So start by asking yourself, why do you want a website? What do you want it to do? Think of your site as a tool that can help you achieve business goals. The goal depending upon your business, but here are some examples. Building your company brand, generating leads, making sales, re-engaging customers, attracting employees, providing customer support, and much more. To get all of these done, you want to figure out who your target audience is. Who is your website actually for? This will influence how you build your website to achieve your goals. Your audience impacts everything, from the graphic design to the words on the web pages. Your site should not try to be everything to everyone. Narrow in on your audience, not the entire world. Defining your target audience might sound simple, but it takes a little bit of effort. You want to try and understand your customers. It's relatively easy to define an audience with demographic data like gender, age, and employment status. But if you stop there, it makes it more difficult for your business to stand out among competitors. And if stereotypes, um, there, there can be stereotypes about your audience, which can lead to false assumptions. So ask yourself, what makes your audience unique? Think about how they act, how they think, and how they live. Your goal is to develop a more complete picture of your target audience. For example, examine specific age ranges rather than one large age range. Consider location, whether you're in the city, suburbs, rural. Consider education level, types of employment, values, and especially hobbies and interests. Consider their view of your product or service. The necessity, nice to have, special treat, things like that, depending on what kind of products and services you offer. Once you've de defined your audience, keep them in mind when moving forward with your site. You can even use a current loyal customer as an example during this exercise. Think of one customer you have that you value. 
What does that person do for a living? What motivates them? What kind of interests do they have? Why do they keep coming back to you for your product or service? So while you think about this, the next part is how will you measure your success? There's four simple ways to measure this. If you don't track and measure your website's performance, you won't have a way to make improvements. Well, improvements based on the data. Here's another way to think about this. Let's say you made some modifications to your bicycle to make it go faster. If you don't know your maximum speed before the modifications, how will you know if it actually worked? So similar here, you need to track and measure your online success so you know what kind of improvements to make. You should always, always, always be testing. There are lots of ways to do it, some more accurate than others. You can simply start by asking your customers how they found you. Ask them when they call you on the phone or visit your store or office or when you're corresponding by email. You can also get more precise by setting up a trackable phone number. If you advertise with Google, you can set up a free tracking call, which records every time your ad results in a phone call. Um, but there are other ways to do this. You can also track the number of emails and form submissions from your website, which is something that we actually do um, in our office for when people make an appointment based on our website. If you have an e-commerce website, you can do this by tracking your sales. And you can also use web analytics software like Google Analytics to analyze visitors' behaviors and see exactly how they engage on your site. If you currently have a website, take a look at it now and identify what it does and how easy it is for a visitor to accomplish something. Now match this with what you'd like the purpose of your website to be, and here are your new goals. You can always feel free to submit your examples in the chat box for discussion, or you can email me afterwards to continue brainstorming. But I will take a look at the chat in case you guys want to throw in some comments or suggestions or examples of what your business does. So here's another exercise. Think about your website or your future site. List one goal for yourself that you'd like to incorporate. Be specific and realistic, and set a deadline for yourself to get it done. The next part is how will you track and measure the success for this one goal. So now that we've covered some big picture topics, including goals, audience, and measurement, let's move on to the actual website. This section is focused on design, but not simply how pretty it looks. It's not always just about how cool your page looks with the different colors and different things like that. It has to do when you combine design and functionality. They go hand in hand. So the section, second section is focused on how intuitive your design is. In other words, does your site design naturally lead visitors through a process on the site to accomplish the goals you laid out? Here's another way to think about it. Visitors should not have to think about or worse, struggle to find what they're looking for when they're on your website. Your design can have a big impact on whether your site helps you reach your goals. So let's start by talking about the different types of elements on your website. Web design. When people think of web design, they often think of the overall template, the look and feel, like the graphics and layout that consistently appear throughout the website. This is also called the skin of the site, which is only one component of web design. Within the graphic template, there are lots of common elements that appear on most websites. This includes the header, which is the top section of the website. The header usually includes a company logo in the left corner, and most website visitors expect that that logo will link to the home page. The footer, or the bottom of the section of the website, this usually contains important links, contact information, copyright information, and even your social media links, too. Um, and navigation, this usually is horizontal across the top of the site or below the header. It can also be vertically. It all depends on how you set this up and how it looks on the mobile site. Your web design should lay out a set of guidelines that keep the web pages looking consistent, such as the colors, font sizes, font styles, and types of content. For anyone out there using a content management system like Wix or Weebly, WordPress, a content management system is a popular option for building a website. There are many options out there, and they're all a little different. What most do have in common is the ability to change and customize the web design, which is usually called your template. 
All the same principles apply. Whether you're creating a design from scratch or using a pre-built template, navigating the site within that design should be effortless for visitors. A great website design typically has these five things. So here are a few key factors to consider when you're designing your site. Create or choose a professional attractive design that, make it, that makes the design consistent across the site. Many businesses are opting for minimalist designs. In other words, focus on business goals rather than elaborate graphics. Too many graphics could also make your page slower to load. You want to make the navigation clear, simple, and easy to use. It should be easy for site visitors to get around the site going page to page back and forth. A search is also a helpful feature, especially for sites with lots of pages. Most visitors will expect to find the site search at the top right corner of the web page. Your website is a way to share information within your target audience. Useful content is, should be presented in a large clear font with enough contrast to read, which will serve you best. And last, your website can have visitors um, do stuff, have useful tools functionality that helps support your business goals. And don't forget mobile. This is a very important reminder. Did you know that about half of all Google searches now happen on mobile phones? So making your website work on mobile phones is no longer an afterthought. It's basically a priority. Remember your mobile users as you work through your goals, audience, and site design. The good news is that more and more websites are being built from the start with technology that automatically optimizes the website format to best fit the device that's being viewed on. This responsive web design adjusts the site's appearance to best present the information based on the size of the screen and the type of device. By using a mobile-friendly design, this is an important first step. Here are some additional tips while working with a mobile-friendly template. First, you want the navigation to be easy and intuitive. For example, website visitors expect that clicking the logo on your page will return them to the home page. Another thing is that if they see your phone number at the top in the header, it's also expected to just click on the link and it'll directly go to um, your call screen if you're on your, your mobile phone. Another tip is to keep your navigation menus short. On a desktop version of the, of the website, say on a 15-inch screen, visitors usually don't have trouble using drop-down menus and sub-navigations. But comparing that to a smaller cell phone screen, it's a lot more difficult. That's why mobile optimized sites use relatively simple navigations and large, easy to click buttons and links. So now really thinking about the home page, chances are that's the first web page a mobile visitor will see. So what critical information does a website visitor need? A phone number, an address, your hours of your storefront. Make sure that information is front and center. You also want it to make it easy to complete tasks. For example, allowing visitors to use the site without registering for an account. And if they want to buy something, give them the option to check out as a guest. Your site should have some type of form. Um, for example, our site has a form to make an appointment with a business advisor. You want to minimize the number of fields, especially the required fields. Enable autofill whenever possible. And if it must be a big form, Use clearly labeled progress bars to help people get through them. For example, say, you know, some people get surveys um, in the mail, and um, you click on the site, and you think it's just maybe five easy questions, and then there's a, a bar at the bottom that shows you're 25% done, 50% done. Things like that will definitely help people actually complete the form. And finally, you want to optimize for usability on all pages. Research shows that with mobile design, it's best to take an all-or-nothing approach. In other words, you want to build a website that optimizes all pages for mobile devices, not just a few pages. So your home page will be optimized, your blog page, your contact us page, and all the little ones in between. You don't want to just exclude some of them because some people can just get lost and fall off your site. And that's what we want to avoid. So now that we've talked about goals and tips for choosing a design, let's talk about the information within the site. A great website is definitely well organized. And if you don't have a lot of web pages now, your site should. Eventually, at some point, it'll definitely grow over time. Planning how existing and future content will fit into the framework of your website will serve you well. 
So let's take a look. You want to start with the plan. You may have heard the term informational architecture, or IA. It sounds technical, but you don't need to be a web designer, a program, or an architect to actually create one. Simply put, it's a plan to organize information on your website. The IA maps out the sections, pages, and functionality of your site. There are several pages and sections found on most websites, including the home page, an about us page, um, and a contact page. Depending on your business, you'll probably include a list of products or services as well. But how do you organize this information? The best way is by considering your business goals. So earlier in this workshop, you listed a, you, you know, you started a list of your business goals. You can refer to that when you're planning out your website. So let's take a look at an example right here on the screen. In this example, the business sells custom sports uniforms. In this IA that they built, their products are organized by sport, but there's lots of ways to do this. If you'd like, type in some suggestions on the other ways that you can organize this IA for the sports store. I'll give you guys a minute to type that in. Okay, we have a couple of good suggestions. So you can list products, um, you can list the products first with a drop down for specific sports. Uh, you can also remove the general products listing and only list sports. Or you can put the product tab first and then list the contact and about me last. Let's move on to another example. Take a look at how the information architecture here affects the website design. Say you sell cameras online. You're creating a website and you want to make it easy for potential customers to find what they're looking for. The problem is you have a lot of cameras. Your cheapest camera sells for $45 and you have, say, 300 options that range up to $2,000. So how can your IA help you? It can organize the cameras in a way that can help customers find what they're looking for. You know that the, the customers fall into different categories, such as your audiences. One audience includes casual photographers, who are the people who take decent photos but don't need all the bells and whistles. Another audience is made up, made up of professional photographers, who need the absolute best camera they can afford to do their job. So looking at these two options, which landing page would, cause, would a casual photographer choose? Go ahead and type in your choice of A or B. Okay, so we have a couple of mixed um, answers, but the majority is correct. You can go with option A. By organizing the website to present products by price, your website can appear to shoppers who don't need the fancy cameras. But to help other audiences find what they want, think about the different ways to present your information on your site. But keep in mind, there really is no right way to do this. A lot of sites actually leave this option up to you. You can have a drop-down listing to sort by various different ways, which I'm sure if you've ever shopped online, um, you've, you've seen how to do this. You can go and shop by, um, by price from low to high or high to low. You can choose by style, brand, size, and so on. Your informational architecture will definitely grow and change over time. So think about it from the very beginning to set up your website from the start, and you can always change and grow as you go along and track your analytics. So here are a few more tips to get you started. When you're choosing names and labels for parts of your site, keep them short and descriptive. And as you create your website plan, 
Remember to keep the most important information in the main navigation. That depends on your specific business and your goals. Your plan can help you create and select the most appropriate website design template. To get started, define your target audience. You already did this earlier, so maybe you have some new ideas at this point. What do people want to take away from your site? Ask people what they want to take away from your site. Make a list of information features that you already have on your site or you want to have. What are the needs of your audience? How will this help them, help them find what they're looking for and how will it also reach your business goals? For example, well, the, the third one would be make a list of keywords related to businesses. Maybe you can incorporate them into your navigation and organization. Now, for example, our SBDC Center has a page to highlight success stories. To feature this, we highlight, um, we highlight our clients in a page called Client Achievements. So rather than calling it success stories, we further show where the stories are coming from and what they're about by naming it Client Achievements. So now that we've talked about goals, design, and organization, we're getting closer to actually building the site. Here's another way to think about your website. Think of it as a container. It contains all the information that you want to share with your target audience, all of your content. A great website is useful and has interesting content. So let's take a look. When you hear the term website content, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is text, like the words in a book. That's one type, but it doesn't stop there. Images. Say you have a bakery and you sell beautiful cakes. Say you're more than just the local bakery for cookies and things like that. You make engagement cakes or wedding cakes. You might want to add a photo gallery section to your site. Say for a different example, you deliver mulch to residential customers. You might want to add a video that shows people how to measure a flower bed, how to help them order the right amount. And back to cameras. Say you sell cameras and a good idea would be adding PDFs or product manuals so if your customers you know, misplace their print manual, they can go online and read or download the, the PDF. So think about it. What kinds of content would be useful for your target audience? What content would support your business goals? Wherever possible, create original, unique content. This can set your business apart from your competition. So let's take a closer look at these three types of content, text, images, and videos. The best practice for text. Every business website should have these basic tips to keep in mind. Try to include important keywords naturally in your text. For example, if you own some mulch company, say in Nashville, the title on your homepage might say something like mulch for sale in Nashville, Tennessee. Always lead with your most important information first. If your goal is to get people to call your business, keep your phone number prominent. Bullet lists can help make your text more readable. And while there is no rule of thumb, the more frequent you update your website, the more likely it will appear in search engine results. Personally, we try to update our homepage at least every two weeks, or the, the, the most, well, the least would be once a month. We like to suggest um, the clients that depending on the type of business you have, you definitely want to post at least one blog posting per month just to keep your, um, your page current and always popping up on the Google page. But let's talk about more of what you want to write. How can you make your content stand out? One way to set your business apart from the competition is by telling a story. If you tell your audience what inspires you and drives you, rather than focusing on what you sell, you might connect with potential customers. Here are two possible approaches, the personal story and the higher purpose story. A personal story might focus on the moment or circumstance that sparked your business idea. So, for example, with this camera business, say Rachel was six when she got the best birthday gift of her life, a Polaroid camera. Since then, she spent every day trying to become a better photographer. So this website is the culmination of 40 years of her experience, the best cameras, lenses, and accessories she can find. And this business is to help people similar to her story or just interested in photography to use her page and buy her products. 
and the higher purpose story might focus on the greater shared goal of your business. So the mulch business. Elena started this company when she was trying to create an environmentally friendly garden for the students at the elementary school where she taught. She discovered that many garden products were full of toxic chemicals and many forests were decimated for wood. So she started her company to provide a better option, organically grown and treated garden products harvested sustainably. So what's your story? Why are you in business today? And how can you connect this story with interested viewers? I know a lot of clients come in that have just a general business. You know, there, there could be five different, you know, uh, hair care products or um, candle products, things like that. But if you have a purpose or a story of how you became in business, you draw more of a connection to your potential customers. Say you donate a portion of your sales to a certain charity. People who support that charity or are interested in something like that cause are more likely going to lean towards your business. So let's move on to the images. An interesting fact is that 83% of humans learning is done with visual cues. Imagery can have an important influence on the success of your website. So here are some basic tips. Are the images clear and focused? Do they look right in the overall design? It's almost always better to use real photos rather than stock art. Not many people, you know, but some people will just skip through a site if they just see the gen generic, you know, business people around a conference table. Try and use more personal photos. Maybe use your staff around a conference table or use your clients rather than, you know, um, just a stock photo instead of maybe um, a generic picture of the outdoors. I know, like, for us, we're on Staten Island. We'll use a photo of the bridge or a local park or things like that to connect people with where you're from. Before you add an image to your site, make sure you have the permission as well. So say we use a photo of the ferry. We're not going to just um, you know, steal a photo from someone else's website. You always want to make sure that you have the permission to do so. Um, Google actually has a very cool feature when you do an image search that you can select um, I think it's under the advanced settings. You can select which, um, which photos have permission for reuse. Because the last thing you want to do after you build this great site is get a letter in the mail or something of that sort that you're being sued for stealing photos. So digital images have two types of files. One is the file size. The larger files can have a higher quality of, of the image. But there is a trade-off. It does take longer for a web page to load with a bigger file. The second size refers to dimensions. Without getting too technical, you can basically reduce an image's dimensions, but if you increase the dimensions to make it bigger, the photo can appear blurry and pixelated. When you're looking for images for your website, you want to use the formats such as JPEG, JPG, um, GIF, GIF, or PNG. There are other formats like EPS and PSD that will have to be converted before you can put them on your website. And last but not least, every image on the web can have alternative text. If a visitor's computer does not display images or if they're visually impaired and use software to help interpret images, alternative text can be used. This also helps search engines understand that image for when people are doing um, a search. And the third best practice is through video. So since this is a Google presentation, today we'll focus on YouTube. Video is a great type of content to add to your site. Every day, people collectively watch over a million hours of YouTube videos. You can create a free channel on YouTube for your business. And when you do this, you want to keep the three C's of online video strategy in mind. The first is conversation. Rather than thinking of YouTube as a place to host videos, think of it as a social media channel. Your goal is to build followers, and here it's called subscribers. You want more shares, more likes, and more comments. Ask questions in your video descriptions to encourage comments. Keep your questions broad, positive, and upbeat, and reply back to foster conversation. The second is connections. Create playlists to connect videos and encourage visitors to watch more than one. Subscribers are automatically notified when new content is published. Encourage viewers to, to subscribe with call to actions. 
in voiceovers and visual cues. A lot of the times if you watch a video, the last five or ten seconds is a pop-up of the person's, say, logo, website, and they have a big subscribe to me button or something like that. And the third is conversation. You want to include short URLs in the video and description to help viewers find your site or your app. You can also track these clicks by setting up a tracking link via Google Analytics. So here's another exercise for you to help you get started. Write a video description. Ask yourself what kind of content would interest your target audience and what kind of content do you want to create. Do you want to do a how-to video, um, an unboxing video? If you're in the entertainment business, do you want to do like a, a portfolio video or something like that? What actions do you want your viewers to take after watching? Obviously the first would be to subscribe and go to your website. Could be to call you, make an appointment, or visit your site to start shopping, something like that. Um, and do you know where on your website or app that you want to send the video watchers? It could be directly to your homepage, um, which could probably be the most convenient. And you can also select, um, you know, put, put a particular link on your homepage instead of creating, you know, a long website that they're probably not going to remember or write down. So let's move on to another aspect that can help your website achieve business goals, functionality. Functionality refers to features that allow site visitors to take action. It refers, um, if, if you're making a list of all the functionality you want in your site, it might include a site search, a contact form, an online shopping cart to check out, or a custom tool designed specifically for your customers. Since functionality can help support your business goals, let's look at three quick scenarios. Challenge one, a locally owned landscaping company delivers mulch to homes, but most homeowners order too much mulch or too little. How can they help? Create an online calculator for your website. This mulch calculator allows customers to enter the dimensions of their mulch beds and the depth that they want. The calculator would tell them how many cubic yards they need to order. Challenge two, let's move away from mulch, let's do something different, a hair salon. Say you started your own salon, you're the only person working there and you can't answer the phones when you're a client. So what can you do? Create or license an existing appointment scheduling tool so customers can book online. They can, you know, you can connect, connect this to a calendar or connect this to your email and this way as, you know, requests come in, when you have a moment instead of answering phones, you can just book everything right then and there and send a confirmation email when you're done. Challenge three, let's go back to the bakery. You answer the same set of questions on every phone call every day, pretty much. So how can your website help you? Create a simple web page called the Frequently Asked Questions page. This can help your customers find the answers to the most basic questions without you having to answer, say, 10 phone calls in a row with the same exact questions. And even if you use your phone calls to track how many inquiries you're getting for orders, you can, again, track your site to see how many people are clicking on that page. So last but not least, a great website is search friendly. After all, if you made the time, effort, and expense to plan and create your website, you want to make sure that potential, potential customers can find you when they search online. This process of helping a website increase its vis visibility sorry, on search engines is called SEO, Search Engine Optimization. Your SEO merits its own presentation, but this section will give you tips to get your site off to a good start. Here's a little behind the scenes of how Google works. Imagine that the web is a book with trillions of pages. Google's job is to read the book, categorize pages, and help searchers find the information on these pages. Sounds easy, right? To read the pages, Google uses software robots called web crawlers, or not my favorite term, but spiders. As new pages are found, they're added to Google's index. The data in this index is, called, is stored in facilities called data centers. When people search, results shown are pulled from the data stored in these data centers. When you start your search, Google's algorithm starts the process of finding the results. 
The algorithm looks at the word or phrase you typed in and uses over 26, two, sorry, 200 signals to identify the most relevant results. Examples of these signals include the freshness of content on a website, the number of other websites linking to a particular site, and the authority of those links, the quality of content, the URL and page title, and whether the best result is a web page, an image, video, news article, etc. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this screen. This is how your search results look. You have the search bar at the top. Um, below the search query, you have your results. The, the ads will always pop up first, and underneath it is the organic results. Creating a search-friendly site helps increase your chances of appearing on this area of the page. Organic search results are the pages that Google's algorithm identifies as the most useful matches for the search. These organic results are free. It's important to note that websites cannot pay Google to appear in the organic results. And advertising does not influence um, your position or presence on the page at all. When you pay for the ad, it just gives you that boost to the very top search. And on the right sidebar, you see a section that provides useful information for the searcher, which is called the Google My Business listing, which we've covered plenty of times before, but um, if you want to learn more about getting your business verified, definitely let me know. This is a free tool that helps you add your business information to the Google Search and Maps page. Here are a few tips specific to building a website that can help. Optimize your load time, especially for people viewing on a mobile device. Original content, useful, information-rich, clear, and accurate content. Include keywords that users would type to find in your page. Uh, make sure your site actually includes those words as well. For links, especially in the navigation, use text when possible. If it's an image, make sure to include the relevant um, alternative text. Good pages and title descriptions. Ensure that the title elements and alternative text um, attributes are descriptive, specific, and accurate. Remember information architecture? Well, it not only helps your human visitors, but it also helps Google interpret the content on your website, including what's more important and what's less important. And last but not least, the design of your site for all browsers, types of devices, and sizes, which includes desktops, tablets, and smartphones. So what's next? We've covered a lot of information in the last about 45 minutes. So let's talk about what's next. Start by making that list of business goals. You will not get very far without the list of goals. If you're building a new site, choose a design that works on all browsers and devices. And if you've had a, your site for a while, check to see how it performs. Remember to use the mobile-friendly test from Google. Um, I'll send this link out in the email afterwards, but I'm pretty sure it, um, the website is uh, testmysite.com um, or, or think Google. Um, I'll, I'll definitely get that for you, but it's, it's a great tool that sends you um, an email report once it's done. The third is to create or recreate a plan for your content, your website's IA. The organization will help the human visitors and the search engines navigate your website more easily. Once you have this plan, you can start adding your content. The more often you publish useful original content on your site, the better. Think about how your website can offer functionality that supports your business goals. Before investing the time and resources building a custom tool, it's worth checking to see if existing software can be bought or licensed for your site. And last but not least, be search engine friendly. If your search engine can't find you, then neither will your customers. If you'd like to learn more and need assistance with writing your plans and goals or getting this done in general, you can reach out to your local SBDC. SBDCs are here to assist you and have plenty of local resources available for projects like this to help you grow and build your business. On behalf of our entire SBDC team here in Staten Island, I wish you great success in growing your business online, and I thank you for visiting in. Again, here's our contact information. You can contact me by email and phone. Be sure to visit our website. You can sign up for our email list for more information and follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.
for anyone who is local, we will be hosting a marketing seminar on Wednesday, October 25th from 3 to 5 p.m. in Tottenville. Um, you can visit this website. You can go directly to our homepage or go to sisbdc.org slash eom2017 to learn more and register for your seat. Um, at this point, I'll take any questions that you have and I'll go ahead and end the webinar. Um, again, thank you for listening in. If you could take a moment once the webinar exits, I'd greatly appreciate your feedback on the survey, and I hope to see you on the next webinar. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box now. Okay, so as questions are coming in, um, how do you increase your SEO, your search engine optimization? The best advice is to keep your pages up to date. Um, post on social media, have your social media pages linked together, and have a blog page. Even if you aren't in a, um, you know, a particular industry that needs a blog, um, just have something where you can repost other articles and, of course, give them credit at least once a month. Um, getting thank yous. You're very welcome. Uh, yes, I will send out the PDFs. Um, I'll send out this. Uh, this whole webinar is recorded, so I will send this out to your email address. What are the benefits of being Google certified? Um, as we saw on the, the search page, the sidebar, where I believe it was the bakery, um, the business listing has its own box on the side. The benefit of this is that when you search for something nearby, whether or not you put in your specific business name, if you're nearby and you're certified, you'll automatically pop up. And this gives you the option of loading um, your address, your hours, phone number, website, photographs, um, you can do the picture, the street view, the picture of the, your storefront. Um, you can even do, um, it's like a, like a, a, pretty much like a tour of the inside. Um, it's very simple to set up. There's a lot of different tools. And even if you don't have a storefront, you can still set yourself as a service location. So if you're servicing a certain zip code or area, you'll still be found like this. You uh, can we create this type of website using free websites creating programs like WordPress? Yes, you can. WordPress and Wix are probably, in my opinion, two of the easiest to get your website going. Um, they have like they they have pre-made templates. If you want to do it yourself, you can just open up the template. And um, I know Wix particularly, they kind of have like a drag and drop feature. So if you want to, you know move an image to the top, a con um, contact me thing on the side. You can drag and drop the different elements of the site onto the page. Um, there are, I'm trying to think of other, like Weebly, um, things like that. But yes, WordPress and Wix are probably the two most popular sites to get this done. Um, another question. Do you have instructions or ideas for non-product like uh, non-product like document preparation? Nothing exciting that can be photographed. Um, if I'd like to, I'd like to know uh, the specific like if you can tell me the specific industry or, or product that you're talking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, some people have services like say you're um, say you're a dentist or a law firm. It's good to have your website so people can know that you're there first. But um, if this is along the lines that you're talking about, like no, you don't have you know a, a cake or a, a bouquet of flowers, 
to photograph for your site, but you can still use, you know, generic pictures. Um, so j just something simple. It could be um, an office or it could be a photograph of, you know, something nice in the neighborhood. Just something visual that people can connect to. Um, I, I hope that answered your question. Yes, okay, so um, legal documents along this line. So say, you know, you're an, a lawyer or an attorney. There are generic stock photos that you can use online. Um, like I said, use, um, there is a drop down option when you're searching for photos to see if there are um, permissions that you can use. But just a generic logo, um, you can use photos of documents, you know, that you're saying document preparation. You know, take, uh, you could take a picture of, you know, pages on a desk that don't have, you know, specific information on it and say, um, you know, you're talking about wills and divorce papers, have like a generic cover page. Take a photo of the different papers on a desk and that could be an idea for you. Um, a minimalist website. I mean, to keep your website short and to the point is always helpful. Um, as long as you include your, the, the purpose of your business, um, specific services and products that you provide, um, contact information, and if you have a location, the, the key factors of your business, as long as they're front and center, that's fine. You don't have to have, you know, 10 different pages to connect to your home page for people to go through. Um, a lot of pages nowadays are minimalist websites. There's just a home page and, you know, there are sites where there's like three different links at the top, but it all connects to the same page. It just shoots you down the, down the, the page, the, the scroll bar. I hope those answered your questions. Um, like I said, if you want to talk more in depth about your particular business um, and the services that you provide and how to get out there, definitely send me an email. Um, you can give the office a call, put the contact information back up. Um, but yeah, we're here to answer any of your questions. Um, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay. Great. So I'm I'm glad that this web this this webinar is for people who already have a website. Um, it's kind of reassessing what you already have to see if you're on the right track. So I'm glad that you're able to do that. Um, but you can always you can always you know continue to brainstorm. You always want to change and grow. Well, not necessarily change, but you always want to grow and develop your site. To, um, to the needs of your customers. So, um, yeah, I hope this was helpful. Try and give yourself a timeline um, to set, you know, deadlines and goals and then reassess your goals through the different tools that we talked about. Um, so thank you for your great feedback and I thank you for listening in. Again, if you could take the time for the brief survey once this ends, um, and definitely email me with any questions. I will end the recording now, and this will be available for you this afternoon. So thanks again for attending.